Thank you for joining us. I am Alexandra Ramsey, Director of Community Relations at the Kensington Reston, an assisted living and memory care community in Reston, Virginia. At the Kensington, we have a passion for excellence in quality of care for our residents. We provide 24-hour on-site nursing, high care partner to resident ratios, highly trained and competent team members, enriching and meaningful activities, and delicious dining entrees all in a beautiful and in safe environment that we like to call home. We partner with organizations that share our values to make the world a better place for people living with both Parkinson's and dementia and their families. We support initiatives for research, awareness, fundraising, and education, much like our partners at the Parkinson's Foundation of National Capital Area. Some housekeeping items this evening. During the webinar, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in the Q&A box. Dr. Grill will take time at the end of his presentation to answer a few of your questions. And now, I am pleased to introduce Jared Cohen, President and CEO of the Parkinson's Foundation of National Capital Area. The PFNCA has been providing programs and services to improve the quality of life for those facing Parkinson's for over 25 years. The mission of the PFNCA is to improve the quality of life of those impacted by Parkinson's disease, their care partners, and families, and foster a sense of community to ensure that no person or family battles this disease alone. The PFNCA offers exercise, communication, and education programs to strengthen the physical and emotional health of people impacted by Parkinson's. The Kensington Reston is proud to partner with the PFNCA in providing this educational program featuring Dr. Stephen Grill. And now I will hand the next portion of our segment to Jared Cohen. Thank you, thank you, Alexandra. I'm, I'm thr thrilled to, to uh, be with you today and to say thank you to the Kensington and Reston for their support of, of PFNCA. I'd like to, to really introduce my friend and a tremendous supporter of PFNCA, Dr. Stephen Grill, who's with the Parkinson and Movement Disorder Centers of Maryland. He's also the founding chair of the PFNC Medical Advisory Board. Uh, um, now rotated out of that role, but he's still very much involved with our foundation, including our annual educational conference, which is called the PFNCA Symposium. He's one of our primary speakers in that program as well. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Grill. And of course, Alexander, thank you again for the great description of our foundation. I greatly appreciate it. But I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Grill, who is who you're all, who you are here to uh, actually see, not me. So Dr. Grill. Hey, Jared, thanks, uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks to uh, the Parkinson's Foundation and the National Capital Area and Kensington for sponsoring the, this. Um, it's really a wonderful uh, uh, series that you, that you have. So uh, what I, I know um, you, you all are here, maybe you have some curiosity about Parkinson's disease, maybe you're slowing down a little bit and you're wondering, do I have Parkinson's? You have some concerns about you, maybe your partner, your friends, and you're sort of wondering, you know, what, what is Parkinson's like? What, 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 what happens early in the disease? I mean, how do we get diagnosed? So let's spend a little time talking about that. I'm going to share my screen. Let's hopefully this will work right. Um, okay, how are we doing? Can somebody give me feedback that we're, oh, it's on the wrong slide though. Okay, we're seeing the slides. Anybody? Um, hopefully, good feedback. Um, okay, so um, so I'll introduce myself a little bit. I'm I'm Stephen Grill. I am a movement disorder specialist, and what that means is that I'm a neurologist, and I also have additional fellowship training in the field of movement disorders, Parkinson's disease, and other movement disorders, other tremors and such. Um, so specialized fellowship training in that. Um, I have my own practice, the Parkinson's Dis and Movement Disorder Center of Maryland, and I have an affiliation as an adjunct faculty and work very closely with my colleagues at, at Johns Hopkins. Um, I've been part of the Parkinson's Foundation of the National Capital Area for, I think, at least 10 years. It's a wonderful organization that provides all sorts of support and activities and exercise classes and educational um, opportunities for our community. So, um, so that by way of introduction, and let's just talk a little bit about Parkinson's. What is it uh, and, um, and who gets it and, and how do we diagnose it and what's it like? 
So first of all, it's been around for a long time. So this is a monk that was in maybe the 1300s was carved repeatedly in a little bit of a stooped posture. And then also with his left hand looking like it might have a tremor. Um, so it's been around for a really long time. There were some early descriptions of what was probably Parkinson's, you know, a thousand years ago. Uh, but James Parkinson's described it first in his 1817 monograph, where basically um, Dr. Parkinson's observed people on the street and, uh, and he, he, he was able to put it all together with keen observational skills to come up with a syndrome that uh, now bears his name. And he talked about involuntary tremulous motion. He's talking about the tremor with less in muscular power in parts, not in action. The tremor is a resting tremor. So it's there when your hand is maybe relaxed on your lap and it goes away when you're moving it largely. Uh, with the propensity to bend the trunk forward, the stooped posture and to pass from a walking to a running pace. This is something called festination that sometimes happens. And then he said the senses and intellects being uninjured. Uh, well, the problem is that Parkin people with Parkinson's disease way back then, well, there were no treatments. So people didn't live long with the disease. Since we have treatments for Parkinson's, people live a normal lifespan. And as a result, people are living longer. And we do see that the intellect, the cognition can be affected um, as the disease advances. But he was pretty good in his description. Um, the main clinical features are tremor, and it's a resting tremor when your hand is maybe sitting in your lap, uh, a rigidity or stiffness, and it's a muscle stiffness, not, not a joint stiffness. It's that you might feel resistance when you move your arm to the movement that has some stiffness in the muscles. Bradykinesia is Latin for slow movement. So slow movement is another symptom. And akinesia is severe, you know, no movement. That doesn't really happen. And then in the later stages, balance problems, but that never happens early in the disease. So Parkinson's is a problem of dopamine, of dopamine neurons that are diseased and dying. That's dopamine, if you're interested, uh, you won't be quizzed on it after this. But what happens in, in, in Parkinson's is that there's a loss of these dopamine neurons. And you can see um, in, the, in the control brain, you see these pigmented neurons. This is under a microscope. And here's just cutting the brain open. And you can see that these pigmented neurons are lost in Parkinson's. Um, and, and that's the main problem. And the loss of those dopamine neurons in this small area of the brain is what's responsible for causing the movement symptoms, the motor symptoms in Parkinson's. Okay, so how do we diagnose it? Um, the way we diagnose it is with clinical criteria. So slowness of movement plus one or more of stiffness or rest tremor or, or balance problems. And then at least three of unilateral onset, it's always one side of onset, resting tremor, asymmetry, a progressive disorder and response to medicine. So here you see a gentleman with this asymmetrical resting tremor and you can see it can happen in the jaw as well. Um, so this, this is somebody who, you know, just on observation is very clearly has Parkinson's. But if we use these criteria, then movement disorder specialists are 99% accurate in making the diagnosis. So there's very few lab tests that are as good as that. Um, but if we use those criteria, if trained people who, who are movement disorder specialists use those criteria, we're actually 99% accurate. Um, there is a specialized imaging study called the DAT scan that can be used if, if, if the uh, diagnosis is in question. But almost all the time, we don't need to do that. It's just a clinical examination and the history. So when should you be suspicious? So I know maybe you're sitting at home and you're wondering, I've slowed up, maybe I'm not keeping up with my friends. You know, and, and when you walk with them, for example, um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people can slow down. You can have arthritis and that slows you down. Um, so there's all sorts of, um, you can have heart disease. You know, there's, there's all sorts of things that can slow you down. But, so, but let's talk about the things that are a little bit specific to Parkinson's. Um, so there are non-motor features, non-motor symptoms that come on 
even before people have tremors or any mo mobility problems. So constipation, that's not so specific for Parkinson's because it's a pretty common symptom, but that's one of the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's that may happen before diagnosis. REM behavioral sleep disorder is a very interesting syndrome. Normally during rapid eye movement sleep is when we do our dreaming. And during that time, our body muscles are supposed to be paralyzed. But in this condition, they're not. So basically you're talking in your sleep, you're acting out your dreams, maybe you're hitting your partner, maybe even leaping out of bed and injuring yourself. Um, so, th and, and people with this disorder in their 40s and 50s, I have to say that most of them or a very good portion of them go on to develop Parkinson's. So, um, so if this is one of the problems that you're, you, you struggle with, um, it, 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 it may in indicate that you have a risk of developing Parkinson's. Loss of the sense of smell is, is another symptom that comes up before the motor symptoms. Um, you know, with the pandemic now, you know that the virus, um, people getting the virus, that they've lost their sense of smell. Um, but the same thing in Parkinson's, but it can be years before they're diagnosed. And then depression. So depression usually comes on in, in, in you know, around 20 in your teens or 20s. Um, if you have, all, you know, suddenly or over some time in your 50s or 60s, if you're feeling depressed and, 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 and being diagnosed with depression, that's an unusual point in your life to be diagnosed but it can be one of the first symptoms in Parkinson's, even before um, people develop tremors or other motor symptoms. Um, and then the motor symptoms, if you, know, if you have a, a resting tremor or shaking or a tremor on one side, or you feel stiffness or slowness, that's when you might wanna be suspicious. Um, a very, very common thing is that uh, the partner, the wife or the, the husband, notices that they're not swinging one arm. And they said, yeah, he just doesn't swing his arm for the last year or two. And that's a very, very common uh, part of the history that comes up. And then micrography, another thing is you might notice that your handwriting has become small. And when you're filling out forms or when you're signing things, that it just gets very small and tra trails off. So these are some of the, the symptoms that you might notice um, before being diagnosed, before it's even clear and, but, but these are things that might make you suspicious and may wanna get you evaluated. So let's talk about the whole course of the illness. And on the left part of the screen, you see before diagnosis. And what you see there is that constipation can develop 20 years before the diagnosis, before the motor symptoms come on. Another thing that's that also noticed is that there's a sort of a personality type. It's not a personality disorder and it's not a psychiatric illness, but a little bit more passive personality, um, less risk-taking, not likely to be skydivers. Um, so this is something that's noted in when we evaluate people psychologically, that there's a personality type that may precede the diagnosis by many, many years. A REM behavioral sleep disorder we mentioned can be 10 years or even longer before the diagnosis. Excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, you may notice, uh, high, uh, decreased sense of smell and depression. So that, that's, those are the symptoms before diagnosis, before the movement symptoms. And then as things progress, then other symptoms can come on, but don't get afraid by this slide because not everybody develops all these problems. Um, you know, a certain percentage develop dementia, um, a certain percentage um, develop balance problems and falls and all that. But what I'm gonna tell you here today is that every point in the disease, at every point in the disease, you can make decisions that affect how you're gonna be later on. And even decisions now before you're diagnosed, or maybe, maybe you, don't, you don't have Parkinson's, but maybe you're gonna get it in 10 years. There are things you can do now that can reduce your risk for developing Parkinson's and also um, reduce the, the symptoms of Parkinson's as it progresses. So guess what you can do that will reduce your likelihood of developing Parkinson's? It's exercise, regular aerobic exercise. Um, people that exercise aerobically in their 30s and 40s and, and even 50s have a lower risk of developing Parkinson's. So that's what you all should be doing. And I know that Kensington, you have exercise classes 
and there's all sorts of opportunities for exercise. So, you know, if you're a middle-aged person or a senior, um, you need to be exercising and you build up to it, you know, maybe work with your physical therapist, um, work with your doctors and figure out a good exercise regimen. And if you do think, but, but again, I'm making the point that, that at every stage in the disease, you have decisions to make. And if you make the right decisions, then it will make things better for you down the line, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line. And, and let's talk a little bit more about this idea. So this is similar to the previous graph, except it's sort of upside down. And I wanna discuss what functional capacity means. So functional capacity is, is, is how well can you do your activities, your activities of daily living, your social interactions, you know, how, how well can you lead your life um, and, um, you know, as we age, all of us become impaired, you know, we, we get older, you know, our, our, um, we're just not quite as, we're not quite as good as we were when we were 18, right? We all know that. Um, and so we all deteriorate a little bit. We all show some signs of aging, um, but most of us can stay in what we call the impaired zone. So when you have a, a disease, any disease, there are different ways to look at it. You, you can be impaired by the disease. And what does that mean? That means that you have symptoms of a disease, but you're able to accomplish everything you wanna do, maybe with a little bit more effort, but you can do it and you don't need any assistance. You don't need help to do it, that you're impaired, but you can accomplish what you wanna accomplish. Now, handicap, the term handicap is not politically correct, I guess, people don't like it, uh, but it's actually a very useful term and it has medical meaning. So, and it has meaning for my golf game too. I have um, a pretty high handicap. Um, but um, so what does it mean to be handicapped? Handi handicap means that you have an impairment, but by using something, by getting help, maybe using a walker to prevent falls, but by using, but by getting some, some sort of help, you're still able to accomplish the activities that you want to accomplish independently. So you may use a walker, you may use certain assistive devices, um, whatever, but you're, you're still able to accomplish things. Disabled is the worst. Disabled means that despite getting help, despite you know, using assistive devices, using getting physical therapy, this, despite doing everything you can, you're still not able to accomplish the things you want. And I make the point that there's a window that you know, as that, that I show the, the shaded area is this window and the decisions you make and the care that you get determines where in that window you're gonna be. So you can make a decision when you're in the impaired, when you're maybe in the handicap zone that I'm not using my walker. I just refuse, I don't wanna be seen in public with it. And what that might do is suddenly, because you may fall and break a hip, you may get into the disabled zone. Um, the other thing is that you may decide when you're in the impaired zone in the, in the beginning stages of the disease, you may decide, well, I'm going to do my share of exercise. I'm going to exercise four times a week. I'm going to do, um, we recommend at least 90 minutes, for example. And then by doing this, you slow the progression of the disease. And then you can end up maybe just in the impaired zone and not even enter the handicap zone. Uh, so there are decisions at every stage of the disease. Um, that, that you can make to make your life better. And that's true of any chronic disease, but I'm talking specifically about Parkinson's here. Okay, so what should you do if you think you may have Parkinson's or your loved one uh, may have Parkinson's? The first thing is don't panic. So as I've, as I've showed you, you know, let's say you, you are you know, at the very early stage of Parkinson's, you've probably been living with this for 10 years right? Because those non-motor symptoms, you, you, you've had the brain degeneration, the neurons being lost, probably going on five or 10 years. So you've been living with this disease for a long time already without knowing what it was. Um, so um, you should recognize that since we have good treatments for Parkinson's, you should live your normal lifespan and it should be good quality. So um, most people really can do this. And again, it's getting the right care, and making the right decisions. 
Um, I'm not painting, a, I'm not saying that it's all a rosy picture. I mean, nobody wants to get Parkinson's, but you really can live with this disease. And I have many, many patients that are 20 and 30 years into their disease, living very active, um, very active lives. I know in our recent symposium, the Parkinson's Foundation National Capillary Symposium, I interviewed one of my patients who's had Parkinson's for 30 years. He had deep brain stimulation 20 years ago, and he still plays golf three times a week. So um, you really can affect how you're gonna do with this disease. Um, and, and again, recognize that every stage, there are decisions to be made and you wanna make the right decisions. You wanna get the right help. You wanna engage your support. Um, you know, make sure your family is aware and let, you know, everybody supports everybody else. So engage your support systems, educate yourself. <clears throat> this, is, um, th this is very clearly beneficial. And there are actually studies showing that educating yourself is a useful thing, that, you're, that you'll cope better with the disease if you understand it. So you know, you're, you're doing that here. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other opportunities for education. Um, exercise. So this is something that, you know, if you come to these symposia or if you learn about Parkinson's, you, you've already seen that I've talked about this several times and it really truly is uh, beneficial. <clears throat> so there are studies looking at exercise. And as I mentioned before, um, if you exercise regularly in your thirties and forties, you reduce the risk. But if you exercise when you have Parkinson's, you slow the, the disease progression. And it's been very clearly uh, seen, you release growth factors in the brain and, and it helps the brain. And you also with exercise stave off that dementia that could happen in a certain percentage of people. So, so really, really, really um, take it to heart. You wanna exercise and you wanna live healthy. You want, you should, if you have a chronic disease like Parkinson's, you should have no weak links. You should be really, you should, you, you should have, be at an ideal body weight. You should eat healthy. Everything else about you should, you should, you should be as healthy as you can, you know, be as health, be healthier than everybody you know. Um, no weak links. And then finally, um, see a specialist. So, you know, you have your support system, you, you have ways to get educated, but um, there is really good evidence that seeing a specialist um, is better for you than than not, and 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 I'm not even I'm saying and I'm and I'm really never shy to say this that you should see a movement disorder specialist if you can if there are one in your area um, if it's if if there are nobody close to you then maybe you can just see one once in a while once or twice a year um, but there are studies showing that people with Parkinson's disease live longer and do better if they're treated by a movement disorder specialist. And it makes sense because Parkinson's is a complicated disease. There's, you know, there's a lot to consider. And um, so I would um, really say that if you're having some suspicion based upon what you're hearing today, um, again, don't panic. This is not an emergency, okay? You know, start thinking about your lifestyle and you know, talk to your internist and say, you know what? I've had these, some of these symptoms, I'm not sure. What do you think? Maybe it's Parkinson's, let me see a neurologist. Let me see a movement specialist. And, and that's the way to start. But, it, but, but again, don't panic. Um, if, if you do have it, you've been living it for a long time. If you make the right decisions, you, you should live your normal lifespan and have good quality throughout it. So I think that's about what I was gonna say. I'm gonna stop sharing. And um, I think, um, Alex is going to come on and maybe I'm not sure if you have I am um, on. have any questions that have come up. I, I do. I have a few. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, the first question is what, what causes Parkinson's? Right. Good question. Yeah. So what causes question? Uh, so we can't answer this fully tonight, um, but it's a, it's a degenerative disease the dopamine neurons are um, diseased. Um, we actually think um, that it, um, it actually starts in the gut. There's a whole nervous system in the gut. And we think that somehow maybe some virus or something triggers it, and then it seeds itself to the brain, and then it spreads almost like a virus in the brain from neuron to neuron. 
and, and, and the, the neurons are diseased, they accumulate alpha, um, the, this, these protein aggregates um, in the cells and, and that might be what actually kills the cells. So um, epidemiologically, we know that people, epidemiologically, I mean, who gets it? Uh, people that grow up, so there's environmental factors. People that grew up in rural areas and drank well water, more likely to get it. There's also a genetic contribution in a very small percentage of people, about 5%, there's a clear genetic pattern where, where a parent had it and then you have it. Um, but in the rest, it's probably multiple genes, maybe 30 or 40 genes coming together in some combination that increases your risk for it. So it's a disease of aging, uh, there's environmental factors, and then there's uh, genetic risk factors as well. Okay, um, I have a question. Is there any link between um, smoking and, and having Parkinson's? Yeah, well, I hate to say this, but um, there is. Mm. So smokers are less likely to develop Parkinson's, but, ah. but don't start smoking, <laughs> all right? Don't start smoking. It may be that it's um, this idea of a passive, a less risk-taking personality. We're not sure it's causal, but it actually there may be something in, 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 in tobacco that is neuroprotective, but we're mm. coming up with neuroprotective strategies and there are, you know, we're coming up with hopefully things that are gonna stop the disease. And smoke, the risk of smoking outweighs any benefit in reducing the risk of Parkinson's. So okay. stop smoking if you're smoking. <laughs> um, is there a greater likelihood that if a person has Parkinson's, their children will, will someday be diagnosed? So again, um, it's about a 5% risk. Um, and, it's, and if you have genetic Parkinson's, you know, there are a couple of recognized genes that we can test for. Um, but usually it's young onset, you know, I have um, some patients in their 40s. So, you know, the typical age of onset is in their 60s. Um, and usually it's the young onset that, that have um, uh, it on a genetic basis. Um, but, you, you know, if you don't have a family history, then, um, you know, I would say it's a, it's a pretty low risk to be on a genetic basis. Okay. Um can you answer if there are any common misconceptions of Parkinson's disease? So there is, where did that come from? That's a good question. <laughs> um, so that's a good, that's a really, uh, so the miscon, there, there are some misconceptions. One is people have this misconception that they're diagnosed and then they should start funeral arrangements. So, you know, again, I think that one of the key misconceptions is that people think that that don't understand that you, you should live a normal lifespan. The other misconception, I'd say this is probably the, the, the second largest, is that there's a fear of the most powerful and the best medicine in Parkinson's, levodopa. Levodopa is an amino acid. Um, it's given in combination with carbidopa, so it's carbidopa levodopa. Levodopa gets into the brain and then it gets converted by an enzyme into dopamine, and that's how we treat Parkinson's. And um, there, there's a misconception that people started on levodopa early in the disease don't do as well. And this was, it's called levodopa phobia. And this, this was developed, this, this, this phobia was uh, fermented by pharmaceutical companies making dopamine agonists. These are medicines that aren't really dopamine um, and they have a lot more side effects. And what they looked at was they, people with Parkinson's, after a certain amount of time, they can develop these dyskinesias. You might've seen Michael J. Fox with them. And they were promoting the idea that being on levodopa was bad because it caused those dyskinesias. Well, we have enough data now to show that it's, that it's how long you've had Parkinson's that, that determines when you get that complication of the dyskinesias. And so they, they did a study they looked at some people in sub-Saharan Africa uh, where they didn't have access to medical care for a long time. So people with Parkinson's weren't getting treated. And when these patients were started on levodopa, you know, many years into the diagnosis, they developed that complication really early on. Um, so this again suggests that these medicines are not harmful and everything we have, um, all the data we have says it's good to be on medicines early in the disease that if you look at people 
um, who were started on medicine early in the disease and then those who weren't started early in the disease, the people that have been on medicine longer that from the start of their disease, they end up doing better. So the two misconceptions are lifespan and that the medicines harm you. And, and those two things we really need to fight. Okay. I have um, two people who are asking very similar questions. Um, the question is, do food choices help control Parkinson? And is there any specific diet a Parkinson patient should follow, ex right. including Mediterranean, keto, et cetera? Right. So that's great. So there are a couple of nutritional things that are important to, to recognize. One is that, um, that um, uh, levodopa is an amino acid. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So if you have a high protein meal, then, um, then and you take your dopa, your levodopa at the same time, then uh, the, the protein that you take may interfere with the absorption of the medicine of the levodopa. So some people, especially with advanced disease, it's usually not a problem early on in the disease, but with advanced disease, some people have to delay their protein meal uh, away from when they take their medication. Um, the other thing about diet, so I think somebody asked about the Mediterranean diet. Yes, the Mediterranean diet has been shown to, and it's sort of like exercise. It reduces the risk of people developing Parkinson's and it also, um, it, it's helpful long-term. So, you know, the Mediterranean diet is, you know, lots of uh, vegetables, fish, um, not so much red meat. You can have a glass of wine, you know, basic, basically healthy living. And, and that's, um, and, and so yes, Mediterranean diet, I definitely advocate for. Okay. Um, someone asked, is COQ10 still used to treat Parkinson's disease? Right, so this was an interesting coenzyme Q10. There was some theoretical reasons to think it might help. And, uh, and it was actually in use. People, a lot of people, including myself, I was prescribing it or telling people um, that maybe it's helpful. There's probably no harm in taking it. But then we did a big study. We did a large multi-center study. We were involved in the study. And the study was actually stopped prematurely, not because the coenzyme Q10 was harmful, um, but um, that, um, that, um, that it didn't work. So it, 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 there was no benefit. So the expense is not worth it. Now, some cardiologists would, would have, you, um, have you take it for some reasons. And I'm not opposed to people taking it because I don't think there's any harm to it. But in terms of Parkinson's, um, um, I, don't, um, I, I don't necessarily recommend it. And I don't know the answer to that other question. Oh, good. You weren't going to make me say that word. What's yeah. the word but about? I, I, um, that's not something that I have experience with, triethyl, trichloroethylene. Um, so sorry. Okay. Um, I do have, a, we have room for one more question, and I do have one more that somebody asked. Um, and it is, how do physicians determine medication needs when you have Parkinson's? Right. So, um, so again, early in the disease, we think it's good to treat you with something. It does now. If you have very minimal symptoms, if you have very mild, you know, maybe a tremor that you, you only get a couple times a day, and it's not bothersome, and you don't really feel like you're impaired by your disease, then we might elect to start you on, a, on an easy medicine. I'll often use what's called MAOB inhibitors. These are um, very well tolerated medicine. They're not as powerful as the levodopa, you know, the, the, the main medicine in Parkinson's, but they can take the edge off those tremors. And I, and I also suspect that um, there is, there may be some neuroprotective benefit to these medicines. So I, can, I use these often early in the disease. And, and the evidence is that starting somebody early in the disease on a medicine like this or any medicine for Parkinson's um, is good long-term down the line. So early in disease, it used to be that people would wait until you were what you you were lost your job or something or you were really impaired, um, and 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 that was based on that levodopaphobia we talked about that people would delay medicine, and it it never really made sense because you know most people get Parkinson's when they're in the middle age when you need to be really at the top of your game, um, not ready to retire maybe, um, and so we should be treating people early in the disease. 
<clears throat> if your symptoms are more significant, then, um, then we use the more powerful medicines. And basically in my, in, in, in what I do is it's carbidopa levodopa. So again, I mentioned that other class of medicines, uh, the dopamine agonists, I think they're nasty and, um, and they have a lot of side effects. They have um, uh, confusion, a lot of nausea, low blood pressure, impulse control disorders where you may act out spending money or gambling or, or act out sexually. Um, there's a lot of adverse events, a lot of side effects. Um, so, and again, I see no reason to use them. Um, so basically we either in the early disease, we may use a very easy medicine like these MAO inhibitors, or if your symptoms are more significant, then we'll use carbidopa levodopa. That, that's how I basically manage people. But it's, and it, but it's a give and take with you. You know, we, we, we need to understand what problems you're, you're facing and what symptoms you're having and, um, and, and how impaired do you think you are? Um, and then we, we base our medication decisions on a discussion with you and then also on your examination, what we see. Okay. Well, I just wanna thank you on behalf of the Kensington, uh, Dr. Grill for being with us this evening and presenting us with all of this extremely useful information. My, my father has Parkinson's, so I was, um, this was very engaging, very informative, and we hope to see you soon. Um, and I want to bring back uh, Jared Cohen, the uh, founder and CEO of the Parkinson's Foundation, uh, to say a few last words. Thank you. And I'll bow out too. <laughs> Thank you, Alexandra. So the, um, and just to correct me, I'm not, not the founder, I'm just the current CEO, but thank you. But I think that um, a couple of things I wanted to address just to let the audience know that in response to COVID-19, our foundation provides programming by Zoom that's available for people all over the country. And the two, two program areas I wanted to address very quickly, number one was a pro, a programs uh, wellness classes, which are done by Zoom seven days a week. Um, they're available for focusing on various forms of exercise, including boxing, dance, seated exercise, high aerobic exercise, um, and also pro other wellness programs that focus on, on strengthening voice or strengthening communication skills. And that's a program we call, we call PFNCA Communication Club. So you can learn more about our wellness programs by visiting www.pfnca.org. Um, and that's, that would be a really great thing to, to explore. I know Dr. Grill spent a lot of time talking about the benefits of exercise. We've got people from, like I said, from all over the country that are logging in, um, you know, certainly every week, often every day, um, to to take classes. And they're usually between 30 minutes and an hour, and they can some people are logging on three times a day based on their schedule. So um, we invite you to learn more about our PFNCA wellness classes at pfnca.org. The other program Dr. Grill also referenced was the PFNCA Symposium, which is uh, an educational conference that's produced by our Foundation's Medical Advisory Board, which as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Grill is the founding chair of that, of that Medical Advisory Board. And we provide, uh, this year it's done as a view on demand conference virtually. It's, uh, it's um, essentially more than 40 sessions by 37 different physicians that specialize in Parkinson's. And you basically register for this conference and then you've got moving forward about two months to view, to view about 27 hours worth of content in whatever order you would like. And I mentioned that one of the sessions is specifically focused on integrative health with an emphasis on nutrition. I know that there are two questions here tonight focusing, focusing on, on nutrition. So you can learn more about the PFNCA Symposium by visiting, again, our website at www.pfnca.org. And there's a navy blue box that says PFNCA Symposium, and you can explore that website and learn more about that conference. But I'm just so thrilled Alexandra, for this program tonight. I want to thank you again for not just this program, but also your support of PFNCA with everyone at the Kensington. So, so thank you so much.